Navy had long maintained a strong collection of naval bases on its south coast, which had been built up over time in defense against their great channel rivals, the French. Additionally, empirical powers like Spain and the Netherlands provided a threat to Britain and her empire, further emphasizing the importance of these facilities. Some of these seaports dated all the way back to when the Romans first landed on the British Isles. These bases had overseen the rise of the Royal Navy, and had held the majority of its shipyards and builders that created Britain's enormous fleet of warships. With the crushing defeat of the combined French and Spanish forces at Trafalgar in 1805, the citizens of Great Britain breathed a sigh of relief. Napoleon had been deterred. His long-held dream of setting foot on the British Isles was crushed by Admiral Nelson and Britain's walls of wood. This victory guaranteed the Royal Navy mastery of the seas for the next century, and great shipbuilding centers like Portsmouth oversaw the changes of the Industrial Revolution, witnessing the birth of modern warships. It wasn't until the end of the 19th century when the obscure collection of unified states that had become Germany began to build up their navy that the Admiralty became concerned. By 1904, the German threat had become far more present and it was decided the Royal Navy would need a northern base to control the North Sea, reflecting a revised policy of distant blockade. This was a change from British seafaring traditions, which called for close blockades in the advent of war. First, Rosyth was considered, followed by Invergordon at Cromarty Firth. But the delays in construction meant that by the time of the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in 1914, neither base was fully fortified. The British then had a difficult decision to make, having no major facilities ready to receive their fleet. It was then that they turned their attention further north than any base before, looking to the Orkney Islands, off the coast of Scotland. Amongst the rolling green hills and desolate islands lay a remote anchorage, Scapa Flow. The Royal Navy had used Scapa Flow prior to the First World War as a staging ground for exercises, but never before had it permanently attempted to shelter ships within these waters. Despite this lack of history, Scapa Flow was perfect for the task, comprising 120 square miles of water, stretching as far as the eye could see. It was said that this basin was large enough to hold the entire strength of all the navies in the world. The surrounding island's populations were tiny in comparison, and they were in for a shock. On July 30th, 1914, an armada of ships steamed into the harbor. These were the great dreadnoughts of the Royal Navy, and they were here to stay until the conflict had ended. Overnight, the villages were overwhelmed with the bustle of sailors on shore leave. Businesses couldn't supply them with all their needs. There were simply too many. The stagnant economy of the Orkneys ignited, skyrocketing as demand soared. With the fleet now stationed there, the Admiral in command, Sir George Callaghan, began to make preparations for war, as it now appeared inevitable that the great powers of Europe were careening towards conflict. However, a man would arrive via train from Admiralty, who carried sealed orders of grave consequences. His name was Admiral Sir John Jellicoe. Jellicoe was a rising commander who was of sharp mind and calm demeanor. He represented the best of the Royal Navy, and had swiftly risen to the top at every phase of his career. Now he held in his possession a letter, the contents of which would make him, in the words of then First Lord of the Admiralty Winston Churchill, the only man who could lose the war in the afternoon. As much as Jellicoe had coveted this position and worked towards it, he now found himself trying to stall the relief of his friend. Callahan and Jellicoe were close, and the former had commanded the home fleet in the years leading up to the First World War. Callahan had a tremendous repertoire with the sailors of the Grand Fleet, and Jellicoe knew replacing him on the eve of hostilities would be seen as more than a slight, and could cause serious problems. This was notwithstanding the fact that Jellicoe had been due to succeed Callahan in two months anyway, but the acceleration of the process on Admiralty's part had the potential to turn things sour quickly. His protests were in vain, as Admiralty grew fed up with the situation and finally forced Jellicoe to open the sealed envelope, confirming him as the new commander-in-chief of the Grand Fleet. In spite of the situation, Callahan understood the need to put his nation above his pride, though he was disappointed for never having gotten the chance to lead his fleet into the battle he had trained it for. After the war, Jellicoe gathered all the telegrams he had sent in protest of Admiralty's decision to show to his old friend that he had never wanted to take his job. When Callahan saw the papers, he smiled and pushed them away, telling Jellicoe he didn't need to see any papers and had never doubted him for a second. With Britain and Germany now at war, Jellicoe set about organizing his forces and preparing for action. The Admiral quickly observed the lack of protection from threats like destroyers, torpedoes, 
submarines, and mines in Scapa Flow, and ordered workers to begin raising defenses. When the German U-boat U-9 sank three British armored cruisers on patrol, Jellicoe became extremely concerned about the possibility of a submarine penetrating the harbor and sinking a large portion of the Grand Fleet. This could erode the British naval strength to a point where the Germans would be able to challenge the blockade. Jellicoe may have been a cautious man, but he was justified in being such, possessing the resources to win the war at sea the day it began. He then ordered more extensive measures to be taken to secure the harbor, and until they were completed, Jellicoe vowed not to become a sitting duck in Scapa Flow. Subsequently, the Grand Fleet went to sea for the remainder of 1914, barely spending any time in port, and when they did, they did so on the western side of Scotland, safer from the threat of the U-boats. However, it was not a perfect solution, as the British lost HMS Audacious when she struck a mine, the only dreadnought the Royal Navy would lose to the enemy during World War I. While Jellicoe was running the Grand Fleet hither and yon around the Isles, construction of the defenses at Scapa Flow was proceeding smoothly. Over 60 block ships would be brought to the Orkneys and sunk, forming massive breakwaters in the entrances. They also served the purpose of enabling anti-submarine nets and booms to be dragged from one shipwreck to another, shielding the harbor from the underwater menace. In addition, minefields, artillery, and concrete barriers were all installed to try and complete the defenses. The Germans would, for their part, make their first attempt to penetrate the waters of Scapa Flow in November of 1914. The U-18 was trying to slip the defenses when a trawler patrolling for submarines rammed her, forcing the sub to run for it. The mission failed. When the measures were finally in place, Jellicoe returned to Scapa Flow, at the time to the relief of the men of the Grand Fleet, who were exhausted from spending nearly half a year patrolling aimlessly. This relief was quickly turned to boredom, however, as the windy bare lands offered few luxuries or comforts compared to Versailles, let alone Portsmouth. To pass the time, games were organized. There were boxing tournaments between the crews of the Great Treadnoughts, taking place on their quarterdecks. Men golfed ashore and hit the small local pubs, which was a bittersweet subject for the locals. As while they appreciated the boost to business brought about by the fleet, the overwhelming nature of thousands of sailors going ashore and drinking establishments dry was a source of frustration for the locals, who had preferred the quiet, secluded nature of their home. This would be the pattern for the majority of the war. The Grand Fleet rarely came out to do battle, and as such the British sailors endured year after year of long summers, only to be followed by brutally cold winters, with the sun only emerging for a few hours a day. After the Battle of Jutland, the German high seas fleet seldom sailed into the North Sea, and activity dropped to such low levels that parts of the Grand Fleet began to be relocated to Rosyth. Though the man who had raised the defenses for the home of the Dreadnoughts was no longer in command by this point, the legacy of his efforts would extend into the Second World War, with many of the defenses still in place by the outbreak of the conflict. However, by this time, much of these measures were quite run down, and it would take another painful lesson for the Royal Navy to see the danger of the submarine and increase the protection again around the flow. There was one more dramatic act that had yet to play out in the Orkneys. On the 21st of November, 1918, the German high seas fleet was met by the Grand Fleet, along with ships from several other Allied navies. Forming up so that they surrounded the German dreadnoughts, the Grand Fleet then escorted the high seas fleet towards the Firth of Forth at Rosyth with guns trained on the worn-down German ships from either side. C and C of the Grand Fleet, Admiral Sir David Beatty, hoisted a signal upon their arrival, stating that the German flag would be lowered at sundown and was not to be raised again without permission. This humiliation was made worse when it was announced that they were being moved to Scapa Flow for internment until a peace agreement could be reached in Versailles. The men of the High Seas Fleet endured the brutal winter that the sailors of the Royal Navy had suffered for the previous three years. They were in effect prisoners, forbidden from going ashore, held captive in the towering castles of steel that had once symbolized German greatness, as the victors debated over the spoils in France. This internment was made worse by poor food, a spotty mail supply, and a fundamental lack of recreation or leadership. Finally, recognizing that his fleet of warships would likely be handed over to the victorious nations following the signing of the Treaty of Versailles, the German Admiral in command, Ludwig von Reuter, made one of the boldest decisions in maritime history. At 1000 hours on the 21st of June, 1919, an innocuous looking signal was hoisted on von Ruta's flagship, ordering the fleet to execute paragraph 11. Men quickly went below and opened their ship's seacocks. Flood valves were opened to ensure the ships would sink quickly, and very soon the great German dreadnoughts began slipping below the shallow waters. 
The Grand Fleet had gone out for exercise that morning and was now hastily speeding back to try and salvage something of the scuttling before it was too late. Chaos ensued as British forces present tried to get the Germans to stop, and as a result, several German sailors would be executed. When Admiral Fremantle returned, he was outraged. He had von Reuter brought to his quarter deck and let loose a barrage of insults at the German admiral, who looked on in silence and melancholy. The German sailors were made prisoners of war, and privately, Fremantle confessed that he felt some sympathy for von Reuter and could understand his decision. The scuttlings instantly solved the issue of how the fleet was to be divided up and created the far more complicated problem of how to remove the wrecks, as they interfered with the Royal Navy's ability to use the flow. Salvagers would pull off an astounding feat and raise nearly all the ships, most of which were broken up and sold for scrap, while some who were in better condition were used as gunnery practice. Three German dreadnoughts would be too deep to be saved, and their rusting hulks still lie at the bottom of the flow to this day. Presently, the Royal Navy no longer uses Scapa Flow, with the harbor mainly providing a haven for petroleum tankers seeking refuge from the cruelty of the North Sea. Many block ships, barriers, and guns remain, slowly being eroded by the rain, wind, and winters that defined the Grand Fleet's experience during the First World War. Thank you so much for watching. If you have a suggestion for a future video, please leave it in the comments below.